Israel news, war in Israel. We have Hezbollah, Hamas, Syria, Iran, Israel. These are the main characters in this ongoing drama. Yes, the news from Israel is war. There are daily bombings and missile launches and missile attacks upon Israel. There's surprise attacks and bombings on a daily basis. Who are Benjamin Netanyahu and who is Hassan, who was Hassan Nasrallah? These are the things, I want to, in this short brief video, I want to touch upon a few things. I want to give a brief recount of the history of the current conflict in Israel. I want to give some brief commentary, and then I want to do a brief Bible study, because that's what this YouTube channel is about, Bible study, studying the Word of God. So I want to put that all into context, and we're going to study how this war in Israel, the current conflict in Israel, how it affects Bible eschatology or Bible prophecy, how does it affect premillennialism or the belief that Jesus Christ is coming again to set up his literal kingdom of God upon this earth. How does it affect the future of Israel in Bible prophecy? Uh, we're going to look at these things in this video. But before we get into all of that, let me read you two Bible verses from the, first of, from the book of Psalms. Psalm 47 says this, For God is king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Hello, thank you for watching. My name is Ralph Blake and I've been a Bible teacher for 50 years. And right now I'd ask for you to do two things to help me out. This is a really big request I'm making of you. Number one, if you could please hit the subscribe button, maybe even hit the bell so you get notifications, but hit subscribe and also give us a thumbs up, like this video and share this video and even make comments. These things help this YouTube channel to grow so that we can get the word of God to more people. So please do those things for me. Just hit subscribe and like this video or share this video. And by the way, all comments are welcome and I'll try to answer each and every one of them personally. All right, let's get into this. All right, let's briefly recount the things that we're talking about in the current war in Israel. Well, it's no surprise because since Israel began as a nation in 1948, there's been almost non-stop war in Israel. There have been a few brief periods of peace and security for the nation of Israel, but Israel is hated by all of her neighbors. Israel is a hated nation in that whole Middle East, and so there have been war after war after war. But I want to confine our car comments today to the current war in Israel, the war with Iran, the war with Hezbollah. That's what we want to talk about. It started just over a year ago on October the 7th in 2023 when Hamas from Gaza invaded Israel and killed 1,200 innocent Israelis and took 250 hostages. Israel then soon retaliated and the war in Gaza has been going on pretty much constantly ever since. That is how it all began. Well, uh, Hamas was getting now uh, soon after that, got support from Hezbollah. Hezbollah is another terrorist organization that is an ally to Hamas in their hatred of Israel, and they launched attacks upon Israel from the north in Lebanon. Uh, missiles and rockets were attacked, upon, fired upon Israel from Haz Hezbollah. So now Israel is fighting in Gaza in the south with Hamas and in Hezbollah in the north in southern Lebanon and northern Israel. Uh, many lives have been lost on all sides. There have been Israelis killed, Lebanese killed, and Palestinians killed. There are many lives that have been lost, many thousands of lives, and most of them are innocent lives and innocent bystanders who are not direct participants in the war, yet they are casualties of this war in Israel. Now, the sides, the different parties involved in this war are not all equal. Uh, for example, Israel is a sovereign democratic nation. Uh, Hamas and Hezbollah are simply terrorist groups and they are recognized as terrorist groups by most of the world. Now, they do have political wings, but the political wings of Hezbollah and the political wings of Hamas are subsidiary and secondary to their military objectives and to their military dominant forces. Hezbollah and Hamas have shared one thing in common, their goal. Their goal is the complete end of the state of Israel. That is their goal. That is what they want. That is what they strive for, the complete annihilation and getting rid of the nation of Israel. Now, both sides in this war, Hezbollah and Israel, Israel, Hezbollah and Hamas, all the sides in this war, um, 
have killed civilians. But this is war. Those things happen, unfortunately, in war. It is sad, it is sorrowful, and we all regret it, but it happens. Now, all sides are not equally guilty. Uh, Hamas and Hezbollah, being terrorist groups, are not as careful about the li taking the lives of civilians. And because they are terrorist groups, as all terrorist groups have done and always do throughout history, is they hide behind their civilian populations. So it's nearly impossible for Israel to kill any of Hezbollah's leadership without the innocent lives of citizens being taken. It's nearly impossible. Now, Israel uses precision airstrikes to try to minimize this as much as they can, but civilians are lost. Now, Hezbollah, on the other hand, being a terrorist group, is not so careful about the taking of civilian life because their war is with all of Israel, not just the soldiers, if you will. Now, let me just give you a few instances of some of these things. On July 27th of this year, Hezbollah launched missiles into Golan Heights and killed 12 children playing soccer. On uh, July 30th of this year, Israeli airstrikes in Beirut killed a Hezbollah commander named Faud Shoker, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, and another military advisor, but also five civilians. On September 25th, Israel jets fired missiles at military targets in southern Lebanon. Hezbollah on that same day launched hundreds of rockets into northern Israel. So one had targeted airstrikes and one just simply sent hundreds of rockets into northern Israel. On September the 27th of this year, Israeli airstrikes killed the longtime Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah. Hasran Nasrallah was killed by targeted airstrikes from Israel on September 27th. On the 30th of September of this year, Israel began ground invasion of southern Lebanon the goal is to clear out Hezbollah, aiming at, at Hezbollah military sites and targets. Their aim is to push Hezbollah farther into Lebanon so that they are farther removed from the northern borders of Israel. The goal was Israel is trying to get 60,000 Israelis who have been moved out for their safety to be able to move back into northern Israel. And so they are now in a ground war in southern Lebanon. On October 1st, Iran fired over 180 ballistic missiles into Israel. Yes, Iran fired missiles into Israel. Iran. See, here's the key. Really, this is a proxy war between Iran and Israel. Hezbollah and Hamas both receive military aid and funding from the nation of Iran. These are facts that are known by most of the world. In fact, if it was not for the support of Iran, both Hamas and Hezbollah probably would have been gone out of business or been of very little significance long ago. So there we have the two sides. We have the terrorists and Israel. We have Iran and Israel. We have Hezbollah and Israel. These are the sides in the conflict. Israel is simply seeking to defend her people and her sovereign borders as a democratic nation. Now, does Prime Minister Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu, does he sometimes go too far in his retaliation against Hezbollah or Hamas? Yes, perhaps he does. Sometimes he's a little overly aggressive in trying to retaliate. But then again, he knows the enemy better than I. Does the Bible say, now here's where we want to change gears just a little bit. Does the Bible say anything about this war in Israel? There are many on YouTube and all over social media where you can read people saying things like, we are watching Bible prophecy unfold before our eyes. Is that true? People say these things are a sign that Jesus is coming soon. Is that true? Now listen, I have been a Bible student and a Bible teacher for 50 years. And as far as I can see, no, that is not true. We are not watching Bible prophecy unfold. No, these things are not a sign that Jesus is coming soon. Now, the Bible does talk about wars in Israel preceding the return of Jesus Christ, but those wars are going to be of a much greater size, and they're going to involve many other nations, not a couple small terrorist groups. It is not the same thing at all. Uh, those things are certainly talked about in the Word of God. We are not to run around seeking signs and looking for those things. We are simply to be busy doing the Lord's business until He comes back, as He said. We are to watch, 
Be ready because the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night, says the scriptures. Let me give you just a couple of Bible scriptures from the book of Revelation, the prophecy of the Apostle John, the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, gives us some things talking about the coming of Jesus Christ and about all the judgments and catastrophes and, and all of the end of the world events that the world, that people talk about. I'm not going to go into all of that today. By the way, on this YouTube channel, we have two other videos that are much longer than this one is going to be about the present war in Israel, about the future of Israel. You can look at <clears throat> excuse me, those videos in this same playlist called The War in Israel, or you can also find them in the playlist called The Pro or Bible Prophecy. Now, let me just read a couple of things. In Revelation chapter 12, we read these verses spoken in very symbolic language. Now, in the book of Revelation, some of the language I will grant and, and agree to those who may disagree with my interpretation, but I will agree with them that some of the language is certainly symbolic language. And some of the language used here in Revelation chapter 12 is surely symbolic. Some of it is to be taken literally. But we find here these words concerning the birth of Jesus Christ. It says, She bore a male child who was a rule who was to rule the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. Now, there's symbolic language there. Jesus is simply described as a child born to this woman who represents the nation of Israel. And certainly he was born into the nation of Israel as the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and David. That is who Jesus was. Now, but this verse that we read from Romans chapter 12, or Revelation chapter 12, excuse me, does tell us plainly three things about the birth of Jesus as a Jew, about his ascension back to heaven on the, near the throne of God, and it says that he is destined to rule the nations with a rod of iron. The woman described giving birth to this son of God is here something described by these words in Revelation 12. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Now, if you go back and read in Revelation, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 12 about the dreams of Joseph and his family, the family of Jacob and, and the twelve sons of the twelve tribes of Israel, which they later became, you will find that this woman is clearly described as the nation of Israel. Now, when we turn over to Revelation 19, which is describing the second coming of Jesus Christ to this world as king and as judge, after all the events of the book of Revelation have taken place, let me read just a few verses for you from Revelation chapter number 12. It says, beginning in verse 11, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire, and his head, on his head are many crowns, and he had a name written that only he, that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and on his name is called the Word of God. And the armies of heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress and the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Excuse me. I, I am not going to disagree that some of this language is surely symbolic, but much of it is also to be taken literally. And it is describing the second coming of Jesus Christ as king and as judge. He will come and judge on behalf of God as the Son of God, as the Son of Man, as God the Son, Jesus Christ, will return and he will institute upon the world of the rebellious nations of the world who have rebelled against their creator, he will execute the righteous and just wrath and judgment of God. He will come as judge to judge the world. That's what the book of Revelation is about. He will also come as king. And ultimately, at the end of that period of judgment, he will establish his kingdom upon this earth. And it says he will rule and over the nations with a rod of iron. He will set up his, well, his well, Bible 
scholars call the millennial kingdom, the kingdom of God upon the earth for 1,000 years of peace and tranquility and prosperity that the world has never known because there will be no open sin. There will be no open rebellion. It'll be a world of peace and righteousness ruled by Jesus Christ, the King, who has already judged the ungodly nations. The prophecy of Jeremiah also talks about this. And the, the part that I want to bring in here is the nation of Israel. Because in the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ, Israel will have a key place. They are prominent. They are central to the whole thing. Jesus is the son of David, the rightful heir to the throne of David. And as that son of David, he will be the king of over all the nations, but especially Israel at the center of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. They will be regathered. They will be restored. Jeremiah's prophecy in chapter 30 and 31 talk about this in great detail. Again, you can see the other videos that we have. We go into detail on this, but let me just read a few verses. In Jeremiah 30, verse 3, it says, For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back the, from captivity my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I have given to their fathers and they shall possess it. Now, let me say very plainly and bluntly, this Bible prophecy has not yet been fulfilled. It will be in God's perfect time. Let me continue in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 10. Therefore, do not fear, O my servant Jacob, says the Lord, nor be dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. Jacob shall return, have rest and be quiet, and no one shall make him afraid. This has not yet happened in the history of the world, folks. It has not yet happened. Don't let anybody deceive you. Let me continue. For I am with you, says the Lord, to save you. Though I make a full end of all the nations where I've scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you. The chapter goes on in chapter 31, continues, says, Yes, I have loved you, talking about the nation of Israel, the literal seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have loved you with an everlasting love. He goes on to say, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it to the isles afar off, and say, who, He, he who scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of one stronger than he. Therefore they shall come and sing in the heights of Zion, streaming the goodness of the Lord, and they shall sorrow no more at all. These are glorious promises about Israel, the nation of Israel being restored to the land of Israel. You see, the name Israel in the Bible refers to the people the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to the land. And they are tied together inseparably in Bible prophecy. The people of Israel will be put back into the land of Israel, and there they shall dwell in peace and safety under their Messiah, the King Jesus Christ. That has not happened yet. Don't let someone tell you that happened in 70 AD. It did not happen in 70 AD. It will happen when Jesus comes again. Now, the war in Israel now, the present conflict in Israel, uh, excuse me, Israel and Hezbollah, Iran and Israel today, this is not fulfilling these Bible prophecies that will lead to this thing. The Bible prophecies leading up to this time of Jacob's trouble, as it is called in Jeremiah's prophecy, the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be a time of judgment upon the nations of the world that the world has never seen. Nothing has been like it. That has not yet happened. Listen, we are not looking at the end of times. Now, it may prove that the current conflict in Israel may evolve into that. That's yet to be seen. But the current conflict, the current war in Israel is not biblical prophecy. It might lead to it. It might become part of it. Just like I am presently in the middle uh, of the very, be I mean, I'm at the very beginning stages of the outer bands of Hurricane Milton here in Daytona, Florida. These out, this war might be some far outer band of these things. I don't know. I doubt it, but it is possible. We are not to spend our time looking for signs and saying, oh, here it is. Oh, there. You see, Jesus told us, don't listen to people say, oh, here's the Messiah. Oh, there's the Messiah. Oh, here's the end. There's... No, no, no. Don't listen to those things. What does all this mean to you and me then? Well, here it is. 
There are promises of God and they will be fulfilled to the nation of Israel. But more importantly, there are hundreds of promises in the Bible for you and I as followers of Jesus Christ, and they also shall be fulfilled. Let us simply trust in God. Let me close with these two verses that we started with in Psalm 47, which simply says this, for God is the king of all the earth. He's a sovereign God over the nations. Sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Today, friend, I would ask all of you watching this video to do two things. Number one, make sure that you know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Make sure that you have surrendered and repented of your sin and trusted upon Jesus Christ and your hope is in him. And number two, worship and praise the God of heaven. He is sovereign over the nations. Let us simply trust Him. Let us bow to Him and worship Him and humble ourselves before the God who sits on His holy throne. May God bless you. I hope to see you again soon.